Hi, Gabba. Hi, Johan. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for being part of the festival again. Oh, it's so good to be with you, Joe. And I'm very excited that Gabor still hangs out with his non-royal friends. <laughs> <laughs> now you've gone up in the world, yeah. Gabor. You're starting uh, out with uh, those uh, commoners. Yeah. I'll still Please. speak to them. I still speak to the little people. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're very lucky and we're very honoured. I do remember sending a picture of a swan because I've got, you know, I've got two swan friends, George and Mildred, to Gabba saying, you know, he's my swan and because I do. And he said, oh, well, you're, you're speaking to the king's swans. I'm speaking to the king's son. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, anyway, listen, lovely, lovely that you're both here, because obviously you're old friends of AD4E, but you're also old friends of each other. And I'm not sure because you're so busy, but I, I expect you don't get to connect as much as you might want to with each other. So, um, yeah, lovely. And you've been very busy, obviously. I think that's fair to say. Best selling books, newspaper articles, um, Times Square displays I think I seem to remember um, obviously lots of um, high profile really high profile podcasts and and obviously interviewing royal people for goodness sake <laughs> you know all evidence that um, it's all been really successful also evidence of like what change making um, forces you, you both are really so it's all good because obviously we definitely need a few changes in the world don't we um, now as I said to you before we started recording, I've got a few questions to ask or several questions to ask. I haven't attempted any kind of sophisticated plan or structure just because I know that doesn't work with you guys. So I'm gonna be optimistic that I get a few questions in. All connected with the, a disorder for everyone, festival theme of challenging the medical model thinking and the culture of diagnosis and disorders. So the questions are up for you both. So just answer in, in whatever order you like. So my first question, is um, what connects you personally to all of this? And I know you've spoken and written about this often, um, but for our audience members that may not be as familiar, could you say a little bit about, um, you know, what it was in your own journeys that translated to you wanting to do the work you do, particularly the parts of the work that challenge medicalized thinking around emotional distress? Um, what makes it important to you on a personal level? Do you want to go first, Cabot? No, you go ahead, Johan. Um, I think, I think it was hugely personal in that, you know, I grew up in a family where, as we've talked about before, I, there was a lot of addiction and um, craziness. And I went to my doctor when I was a teenager, having had really extremely traumatic uh, experiences. And my doctor, who was a, a super nice person, said oh well we know we know why you feel like this you're just lacking a chemical called serotonin and all you need is these drugs that are going to make you feel better right uh, and, and the drugs did make me feel a little bit better for a while then I felt much worse had all sorts of terrible side effects but uh, looking back now that seems to me so uh and it's not a criticism of the individual it's a criticism of the system so uh appalling you know, that you could have a kind of intellectual uh, system that would take a distressed and traumatized child and not go, well, what happened? Are you, you know, what's happened to you in your life? But just tell this ludicrously simplified story that set me off for years on a path of, well, because it gave me the wrong story about why I was distressed, it, it meant that I couldn't, I, it disconnected me from my own pain and the sources of my own pain and set me off for years and years in a completely wrong direction. Um, uh, and it was only really when I began to explore the scientific evidence around, partly thanks to Gabor, um, the deeper causes of my own distress and the distress in our society from my book Lost Connections, um, that I began to see how crazy, crazy that, that, that was. I guess that's where it started for me. As for me, um, it was both personal and professional. Um, <clears throat> when I went to medical school, we did not get a single lecture about child development or trauma. Oh. And, and the average medical student still doesn't hear about that through the course of their training. 
So when I was in my mid fifties and first self-diagnosed and then formally diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, the mantra was that this is a primary brain disorder genetically generated and transmitted. But that never made sense to me because I knew that the tuning out, the absent-mindedness that characterizes the condition is not a disease genetic or otherwise, it's a coping mechanism. And every brain invokes it when there's stress. So clearly, given my own childhood history of early stress, it wouldn't seem natural to me that as my brain was developing, tuning out would be a part of its mechanisms because of the horrendous conditions under which I spent the first year of my life as a Jewish kid in Nazi occupied Hungary. I did, what I didn't know is that there was a vast body of science that nobody talks about in medical school about how the human brain actually develops in interaction with the environment. So that the emotional circuits of the brain and the neurotransmitters and the capacity to pay attention, regulate impulses, and so on, all develop in, in interaction with the environment. And the more stressed the environment, the more that interferes with healthy brain development. Therefore, when we talk about mental health conditions, we're looking not at the impact of genetics, but at the impact of the environment. And um, uh, as a physician, I also saw that in my patients who were diagnosed with mental health conditions, there were always histories of childhood trauma that the psychiatrists never ask about. But I knew these patients because I was their family doctor. So that the relationship between childhood trauma and adult stress and mental health conditions just became absolutely clear to me. And Johan's book, Still in Focus, came out, I think, half a year before my book, The Myth of Normal. And he actually gave me unwittingly, when I interviewed you, and he gave me unwittingly the title of one of my chapters, because he talked about how the usual explanation of mental health conditions gives us a, an inadequate map to our pain. And, and the point being what I already had experienced, I just thought he had such an elegant way of putting it, that, that these mental health conditions are all manifestations or attempted escapes from pain. And we need a map to that pain to understand these conditions. So the usual medical mantra of genetically caused, biologically determined mental health problems made no personal sense to me. And it also makes no scientific sense. And <laughs> fin finally, I just say, Richard Bentall, who's a British psychologist, a member of the British Academy, has said that the links between childhood distress and adult mental health problems is as clearly established as the links between smoking and cigarette and smoking and lung cancer. And so it's not that we're talking against science here. We're actually saying that the current view is unscientific and unhelpful. Yeah, so thank, thank you both. Um, no, it's really important, isn't it, that people kind of are reminded that you've got personal stories that really make sense um, in relation to the work that you do. I wanted to ask something about the act of writing, your, your writing obviously changes hearts and minds. And I wondered about when you first understood the power of writing as a force for change. And I wondered also whether you could remember the, the first book that you ever read that changed, either changed your heart and mind about something or really affirmed something and gave you, you know, clarity in a, in a way that was different than you had before. You know, it's funny you asked that, Joe, because we've you've, you've met my sister, who's probably in the audience for this, um, who's uh, training to be a, a psychotherapist, and um, <laughs> we were talking about this because I, so we grew up in this insane environment. So the way I cope with that was primarily by reading all the time from when I was very, very small. But yeah. I mean, like, so most people have rather sweet answers to this question, like, oh, I read, you know, Black Beauty or Anne of Green Gables. But when I was ridiculously young, I was reading like serial killer biographies and things so like, so like my like heartwarming tale is I would read like The Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer or some like horrifying, um, uh, disturbing. Um, yeah, so that, that's my touching, heartwarming uh, answer. What's, what's yours, Gabble? What I'm picturing you as a child. What were you reading? Well, you know what, for me, um, I was in high school here in Vancouver, British Columbia, way back in prehistoric times. And uh, <laughs> there's a local newspaper columnist that ran a contest for high school students, a contest where 
thousands of kids would submit columnists for a day it was called and there were 2,000 entries and eight of them were chosen and mine was one of them to be published in the newspaper um, and the columnist whose name was Jack Scott sent me a postcard which says you can write oh. and that changed my life and so um, all throughout medical school and, and particularly when I was a physician I would write articles for newspapers actually I'd write about politics and medical issues and so on you know I, but 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 in me there was always always a drive that I need to write a book and I was in my mid-40s I was so frustrated that I hadn't and then I was diagnosed with ADHD um, and then um, I figured out that this beast isn't what they say it is that's when the dam burst for me. And that was my first book, Scattered Minds, and uh, published 25 years ago now. Wow. And so that, God, and time flies. How time flies, I know. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I had a, a patient who was a poet. He's a very, very well-known Canadian poet, Warren Tallman, his name was. And uh, Warren would come to my office and uh, mid talk. And I, I said to him, Warren, uh, I really want to write, but I don't know what. And he said, Gabo, you'll write something when you have something to teach the world. Mm -hmm. And after that, as soon as I figured something out, I saw something in a way that others hadn't seen or hadn't presented. I got to write about this. So all my books came along because there's something that I saw that I think needed to be said and nothing, it just wasn't in me to keep quiet about it. So five books later and I'm working on the sixth it's all because there's something I want to say that I see about the world that I really want to share with other people and that's really cool and like that that makes me want to ask this next question about you know while I've got you both here the opportunities that I am like so what what advice would you have for people who want to use their writing as a way of challenging attitudes have you got any like little gems that you can throw at us well the advice i would give is not advice that i can follow myself to tell you the truth but um and you know what i think johan and i might not might not be the best examples <laughs> because by the time i wrote my first book i was a reasonably well-known medical columnist in canada so there was a listening for me already. So when I came up with a book idea, publishers, they didn't exactly beat a path to my door, but they were interested enough to, you know, you know, and I think you had a reputation as a writer and a journalist before you wrote your first book. Yeah. So it's hard so that for somebody with a reputation and, and a demonstrated capacity to write, it's not so hard to break into the publishing world. What I say to people that haven't had that, um the way prepared like that is if you're going to write write for yourself write because you have to don't worry about the reception i mean think about who you want to write for but don't wait for the approval of others before you start writing just write because it's in you write because it's in you uh, that wants to come out so true it's such a powerful way of expressing yourself I guess and like not so not just to inform change but being it can be really personally cathartic and I know a lot of people approach us at Madden in the UK to write blogs as a way of trying to kind of contribute something to informing change but also getting stories out there so I would the advice I would give um for people who want to write is I think sometimes people think that writing is some like exalted thing which is different to their ordinary communication and I don't think that Gabor right you you Joe you write the way you speak Gabor writes the way he speaks I write the way I speak to me most good writing not all his poetry is kind of heightened lyricism okay sometimes it's all right but most good writing just resembles normal human communication it's a more condensed type of form of it so I would say people who are blocked uh, a really good place to start I would say sit down with someone it, crucially, it has to be someone who already doesn't know, who doesn't already know the story. It doesn't work if they already know it. And just tell them the story for an hour and record yourself on your phone. 
and then put it into one of those transcription services that, that just does an exact transcript. And then you have your first draft. Because there's a thing about people get intimidated by the blank page, they get blocked by a blank page, but very few people who know what they want to say are blocked in ordinary communication. You might stop for a minute and think, was that how I want to say it? But you generally, when people are telling their own stories or their own thoughts, they don't get particularly blocked in speech unless they're paralyzingly shy or something. Um, so I would say do that and that's your first draft. For me, the biggest thing for a lot of people is getting to that point of something being on the page and it being a first draft and just talking and really, you know, you can tell your story to someone over 10 hours in 10 blocks of an hour. That's only, you know, 10 weeks, meet up with someone for an hour and then you've got your first draft and then the, just the other quick bit of advice I would give is once you've done that, I, there's an amazing, the, by far the best book about writing. I have a complete addiction to books about writing. It's one of my forms of procrastination. I don't yeah. write, but I tell myself I do something good by reading a book about writing. Um, is a book called, book called Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott, which is an absolutely, truly great book. It's Anne Lamott, L-A-M-O-T-T, -T, I think is how you spell it. Um, but yeah, those would be my two starter bits of advice. Anne, Lam Anne Lamott, you say? Yeah, have you never read it, Gabor? No, no, I know the writer. Oh, oh, you would love that. I mean, you'd love her work, her work generally, but she okay. is it's called Bird by Bird because when she was a kid, she went to the Brooklyn Museum yeah. and there's this enormous tapestry of like thousands of birds at the entrance to the museum. And she said to her dad, Wow, how did how did ever anyone ever paint this? And so yeah. they painted it bird by bird, right? I mean, that's the opening metaphor, but completely, it's both a really poetic book and a book that really works as actually very practical advice. The great book. Oh, excellent advice, you two. Thank you. Um, here's a question. So, Johan, in Stolen Focus, you talk about obviously our attention having been stolen, you know, our ability to be focused and conscious and reflective and connected and all of that. Um, this is a question to both of you. So would you agree that in a similar way, so as our ability to, to almost be deeply emotional and have feelings, sometimes really difficult feelings without it being kind of positioned as a problem or is it worse, at worse a disorder? I mean, I think you see that most clearly when it comes to grief. It, or or it, the madness of it is most clear when it comes to grief. So I think we might have talked about this before, but um, Gabor, you know Joanne Cassiatore, don't you? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. So Joanne, um, a completely amazing person. Joe, do you know her? Have you, have you met her yet? Yeah, I, I've interviewed Joanne and she's actually doing a workshop for us in, I think it's October, which I'm really excited about because you know her diary is full for like kind of two years at a time. Yeah. But she's she's a brilliant ally and yeah, I'm really, really glad to get that date. So hopefully those, those people are coming here, her wisdom. Everyone watching, Joanne is one of the wisest people I've ever met and I cannot recommend her workshop enough. But so just to very briefly, uh, one of the insights she is. So Joanne, for people who don't know, Joanne had a daughter, a baby daughter called Cheyenne who died shortly after being born. And almost immediately after her daughter died, she was offered, I think literally like a few hours after her daughter was died, she, uh, her daughter died, she was offered antidepressants. And she said, well, what do you mean? I'm not depressed, my child has died. And, like, and anyway, she then learned, she's also a professor of social work, she then learned that, I forget the figures, but an extraordinary proportion of people whose children die are immediately given antidepressants. And in fact, in many cases, antipsychotics, right? And she was like, but this is crazy. Grief is not a, a malfunction. It's not a disorder. In fact, you would be disordered if you didn't grieve for your child. That, that would be a sign something had gone really wrong, right? In fact, that's the, what the opening line of the Albert Camus novel, um, The Stranger, is you have something like, my mother died and I didn't cry. And the minute you say that, you're like, oh, we know there's something wrong with him, right? Um, the, 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 so... But so she works a lot on the pathologization of grief, right? And in the in the American, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the kind of Bible for diagnosing mental illnesses, uh, diagnosing mental illnesses, I think, yeah, quotes around both, is, um, you know, you're, you're allowed a tiny little window in which to feel sad if someone, to feel yeah. sad if someone dies. And then if, you, if you're sad beyond that window, then you're mentally ill, right? And you should be pathologized and diagnosed and drunk. Then yeah, and then you're diagnosed with what they call prolonged the grief disorder. And again, the problem is seen in the individual. But if you look at cultures historically, every culture used to have communal grieving rituals. 
and practices. So the Jewish uh, shiva, where people come over and they bring food and they tell stories and you connect, you know, and 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 you support the family and and the keening, and the, you know, in Ireland that goes on and dancing and drumming in other cultures. These grief rituals help to dissipate and and share the grief. Um, it's a failure of our society that leave, we leave people so alone. And then we diagnose them with something, prolonged grief disorder, because culturally we haven't given them the means and the context in which to really experience and process their grief. Yeah, absolutely. I think the grief thing is such a, such a good example. Um, it's I, I no one is... Yeah, it, it's indefensible, the situation. Yeah. It, it is indefensible, but it also applies to many other kind of, you know, emotions and feelings. I, I know, you know, Sammy Tamimi, he talks a lot Not about, um, you know, kind of kid, children's emotions and feelings being pathologized kind of almost automatically rather than being understood as just a normal part of growing up, you know, these well, days. Um, there's, in, in the myth of normal and in my other books, I cite um, a neuroscientist lamentably died of cancer a year before his time. His name was Dr. Yak Panksepp, P-N-K-S-E-P-P. -P. And, and, and Yak looked at the emotional brain systems of mammals. And he said, basically, we share some emotional brain systems with other mammals, which include grief. So grief, there's actually brain circuitry for grief. Why is there brain circuitry for grief? Because we have to come to terms with loss because life is going to bring losses. And, our, and very often it's the curtailment of the child's natural grief that then leads to depression, that then leads to dysfunction. And um, a co-writer of mine in one of my books, Dr. Gordon Neufeld, brilliant psychologist, he says, you should be saved in an ocean of grief. And sorry, in an ocean of tears. But what he means is, when the trauma that we've talked about here is not grieved, that's when we get stuck in dysfunctional mental health patterns. If I was abused as a child, I wasn't, but if I had been, um, I'd been able to grieve and somebody had been there with me to share my grief, I would not be left with any kind of a disorder. I just would have let go. So a lot of under, out of a lot of mental health conditions, so-called, what we have is unresolved grief because the grief circuitry in our brain wasn't exercised because the adults around it us didn't know how to support it. So grief is actually, I'm very, I mean, I work with people in the therapeutic setting. One of the first things that happens is once they really touch, once they really touch with what happened to them, they grieve. All of a sudden the tears show up and that's where the transformation begins. Essentially, because you also see and I thought that was one of the many brilliant bits of, of your most recent book, Gabor, because the one of the things I was thinking about when you think about, because when I was reading that, I thought, it's a curious thing, isn't it? Everything that we say, uh, sort of for everyone that Gabor says that I say, I always feel like what we're doing is we're telling people unbelievably obvious things that they already know at some level, right? Yeah, what's yeah. kind of interesting, and this is obviously a thing that's explored in, in, in both your work, is how did we get to the point where these things we emotionally and intuitively knew, we built systems that deny them, push them aside. Um, and part of what's going on is a kind of, think about Joanne and, and grief, right? Yeah. Why, why does the DSM give you six weeks to grief and then you're grieved for your dead child and then you're pathologist? Because if, because if you're given longer, then you're allowed longer off work right, uh, under the, the, you know, then you're ill, are you given more time off work? So there's a kind of capitalist dictate, which is like, your job is to be a little worker bee. And if you're sad that your child died, okay, we'll give you a little moment to be sad. And then come on now, back to work, no more crying, right? So you see, or, or do your crying discreetly after work when you've, you know, when you've done the thing you're here to do. So again, it's this, it, this limited conception of human pain, part, not totally, there's lots of reasons, but partly comes from the limited space we're allowed to be human in a kind of hyper-capitalist system. Does that, does that ring true? Well, yes. Uh, basically, 
basically what the system demands of people is uh, not health but functionality mm. so you can be unhealthy in all kinds of ways you can even be a sociopathic um and be president of the united states but as long as you're functioning so mm. the society doesn't care about human essence it cares about uh, function and so that's... Like, well, that reminds me of <clears throat> what you were saying johan in, in soul and focus about if we slept as much as we needed to sleep to be able to kind of focus and reclaim attention the economic system that relies on sleep deprivation would just be in, in serious trouble and yeah, yeah. He, he, that's from um uh, a great guy at harvard medical school whose name i'm suddenly blanking on ironically because i am so tired um, <laughs> oh god what's he called um great guy come to me in a second but he um yeah so we we sleep 20 percent less than people did a century ago do you think about one of the most obvious and basic human physical needs is to sleep right and we sleep and we sleep in fact children in britain sleep 85 minutes less than they did in 1945 per night yeah, really staggering decline right yeah. and um and that's not some obscure need that's not a need you need to learn to read right we're fucking tired um and and um one of the one of the things that 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 um brilliant scientist whose name i'm going to remember in a second was getting at is um you know if, if we so now we sleep about on average seven hours if we slept eight hours a night that'd be an hour less in which we were an hour a day in which we were consuming less what well, we, you're not consuming anything in your sleep right so that you're taking an hour out of everyone's day uh, in which they're no longer consuming that would cause a huge economic crisis right well, look there was a study uh, some years ago that showed that people that sleep during the day like during the spanish siesta mm -hmm. they have better heart health you know mm -hmm. and so that I, I remember visiting Spain some, maybe 10 years ago, and I go to a restaurant, there'd be a sign outside saying closed for lunch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> because, because the staff goes home and they have lunch and they have a siesta, you know. But of course, that kind of a, a rhythm doesn't meet with uh, factory production needs. You know? It's, like, it's all just... part of the toxic culture that, that Gabba talks about, isn't it? When he talks about like the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry and the tobacco industry and the lack of care for climate crisis and you know all features of the same culture and i think both of you feel that you know all of this disconnect all of this distress in all its many forms is just part of the collateral damage of of, of global capitalism yeah. and, the, and a culture that just doesn't give a shit who it needs to tread on to to make money so, I, 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 saw, I saw an article from Britain the other day uh something like an, an excess of a hundred thousand deaths unnecessary deaths because of austerity in the healthcare system mm. and this is know, another, I mean, it's uh, british children are five inches shorter than they were yeah than, than their european than dutch children which is, and it's a very quite a recent divergence and it seems yeah. to be the effect of austerity and it's uh, David Cameron. to be fair in my defense I was one of the few people who did tell everyone that David Cameron would do this before he did it. So a rare moment in which I was right about something. But, the, but, but you know, I, I mean, I think it's worth saying, you know, these machines, look, markets are machines that can deliver some things very well, right? Yeah. It's just things they can't do. So they, they're one part of what we want in a society. You know, Lionel Jospin, the former French prime minister, said, you want a market economy, not a market society, right? We don't want everything to be dominated by the demands of the market. It's, it, it's a tool. It's a tool that we can use for our benefit a lot of the time. But when it dominates the whole of life, it becomes catastrophic. Well, what I often laugh about is people like Johan and I, we travel the world and we write books and uh, consider the authorities and, you know, thank you very much. We're just saying the obvious, you know, I mean, if if the world ever figured out what's so obvious in front of them, you and I would be out of a job. You know? <laughs> because what are we ever saying? You treat children well, they're going to be OK. You don't treat them well, they're not going to be OK. We're connected and kind to each other like we're meant to be. We're going to be OK. We're disconnected, unkind to each other. We're not going to be OK. That's the whole message. 
it was there was a funny moment for me when uh, Gabor's Gabor interviewed Prince Harry, and the Daily Mail ran some vile horrible piece. Uh, which said the, the crazy views of Gabor Mate. Well, some of them was like, oh, you sound co completely reasonable to me. <laughs> He's right. And I bet, by the way, most Daily Mail readers actually, and maybe not most, but a very large number, would also find those things perfectly reasonable, right? I mean, it's not like it, one of the interesting things is these insights that we're talking about. Okay, so we're critiquing some elements of capitalism, but actually, at a time when uh, we're very polarized around so many things, actually, this stuff lefties, right-wingers, people in between, this is playing out pretty much the same in every part of the political spectrum. This isn't, you know, the, the, these insights are um, quite broadly seen, I think. And and um, in fact, sometimes kind of conservative-minded people can see them faster when it comes to some of the skepticism that we're trying to argue for, although they might not agree on all the solutions. So, so and I'm, I'm, I'm struck, I'm, I'm curious about are you, what you think about this as well, Joe. It really feels like the culture is moving towards these insights, right? We used to be treated as very controversial quite recently in a way that I don't think we are now. Um, I think there's been a cultural shift, you know? Um, Scattered Minds is a book I wrote on ADHD that I mentioned, was republished in the States in February and within a week it was a New York Times bestseller. It was a 25 mm. year old book. I hadn't said a new, you know, People are starting to catch up, and, and your books, Johan, every time they come out, they cause a sensation. Um, Bessel van der Kool's book on trauma, The Body Keeps mm -hmm. the Score, Bruce Perry's book, Prince Harry's book itself, you know, mm -hmm. which is so much about trauma. Um, so that's true that in, 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 in amongst the broad public, there's a real interest and a, a, a desire to investigate. On the part of the mainstream media, on the part of the mainstream institutions, it's still a pretty much a blank wall, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I'll tell you one, speaking of the Prince Harry interview, I mean, the Sunday Times, um, I mean, you read his book, emotionally it was a very deprived childhood. I mean, that's obvious to anybody that with a mother who was very troubled, a father who was having an affair with somebody else from before Harry was born, uh, the mother being absent a lot because of the family dysfunction um, and the, the culture of children not being coddled and held physically in that, in that family. You know, when Prince Charles was five years old um, uh, and King uh, Queen Elizabeth goes on an international tour, when she comes back, she's away for five months and she greets her five-year-old son, the current king, with a handshake. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine? And so I said to Harry that even animals, mammals, they all hold their kids. Mm. They all cuddle, they touch the skin, they lick the kids, they, they, they hold them close to their bodies. Even animals do that. The Bloody Sunday Times wrote an article saying that I said that the royal family treats like their kids like animals. Wow. You, you stupid idiots. I said the opposite. <laughs> I said I, I said I only wish they treated their kids like animals. Either we see kind of a plot here, or what we're seeing here is on the one hand, Johan, you're quite right. On the part of the public, there's this wave of uh, transformation and information and interest because people really need answers, and the mainstream is just not giving them to them. On the one hand, on the other hand, we see on the part of the mainstream institutions an entrenchment and a denial, which is simply a defensive measure because they don't want to give up the control that they have yeah it's there's like lots of paradoxes everywhere isn't there it's like i, I can see like what johan was saying about you know there's some something happening maybe partly a shift happening we are certainly talking about the critique of diagnosis a lot more but at the very same time we've got a generation of young people who were proactively kind of wanting diagnosis and a whole TikTok culture. I can't, I can't yeah. say the word TikTok without thinking of <laughs> Johan. Johan describing it as, um, what did you say? It's a, it makes Snapchat look like a Henry James novel. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we've got this TikTok culture that's really quite worrying at the same time as like dialogue opening up about the critique of diagnosis. So that's a paradox. And also like we were really interested by the kind of public responses to Joanna Moncrief's, mm. um, you know, 
review and the debunking of the chemical imbalance myth because actually what we saw in terms of the reaction was like a real sense of shock like what like they didn't you know like well we didn't know that it's, this is a real shock so yeah I found a really interesting one I think about TikTok but that I really found I actually found the reaction to Joanna's brilliant for people who don't know uh, Joanna Moncrief, a wonderful professor, friend of ours, wrote, um, wrote a paper showing that there has never been any evidence that depression is caused by low serotonin. Um, and this is, a, I mean, as, um, you know, um, uh, some other people have said, it, you can't even say it's been discredited. Right? It was never credited. It was never yeah. Yeah. Theory. But, but what's incredible was the reaction of, so I, I talk about some of my book, Lost Connections, which came out, what, five years ago, it was absolutely monstered for saying this, right? Just monstered as if I'd, you know, committed blasphemy in 1500 or something, right? Um, so, but when Joanne, Joanne, Joanne's paper came out, I thought the reaction was gonna be, because uh, there'd been a shift in the culture, not because not of me, but lots of things had happened in the shift between then and now. Uh, and when her paper came out last year or whatever it was, I really, I don't use the term gaslighting loosely. I really thought it was gaslighting. What you had was all these psychiatrists going, well, we never said depression was caused by low serotonin. No one's ever said that. Where, where you got that idea from? I was really taken aback by that because they could just easily go, they could reasonably say, we believed that at the time. We were, this view was heavily promoted. We, you know, everyone makes mistakes. We did fall for a form of propaganda. They could try to salvage what they can salvage, but they could just be honest about it. But to say we never said that, so you know, ninety percent of British people believed before the paper. I, I, I used I used to say it as a physician. Mm. People would come to my office, and in a low mood, I'd say, "You got a problem of uh, a biological imbalance in your brain. You don't have enough serotonin. Here's some fluoxetine. Here's some peroxetine. Here's some sertraline." And of course, sometimes it worked, you know. But I used to say it because I used to be taught that at medical um, um, educational sessions, and I I bought it hook, line, and sinker, and just as Johan Moncrief in the state in in, in the US in the UK, um, Whitaker is it James Whitaker, a, a journalist? Is it James, I forget it's Robert Whitaker and a journalist, and he started looking at the research, and he kept asking people, "Show me the proof," and he was absolutely absolutely flabbergasted to realize that there's no evidence for the low serotonin theory of depression. And Whitaker uh, wrote a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic. Uh, where he just refuted this whole thing. So to trade that, we never said it. I said it. <laughs> I used to say it to my patients because I fully bought it. And it I wouldn't be an incredible it. thing, if, given that I think it was in John's paper that n something like 90% of British people believed that depression was caused yeah, by yeah, depression. Yeah. What an incredible thing that 90% of people just spontaneously came up with that yeah. or on their <laughs> own. Like, what, a, what a surprising thing for them to come up with. I mean, it's so... Ludicrous. Yeah. But it's also a sign of the brittleness of their system. <laughs> normal scientists, normal science proceeds by the admission of error, right? No science is perfect. We build yeah. on, we learn yeah, yeah. theories that get better and better, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so a normal science doesn't have a problem. You know, physicists go, yeah, we used to believe that and we made this breakthrough and now we believe this, right? That's, that's right. The fact that they can't do that speaks to the fact that at some level they know they've got a very poor evidence base for a lot of their claims. And if yeah. they start to concede one lot of bad evidence, they're going to have to concede lots of bits of bad evidence, and they're going to be left with something that would have to be more humble, more open, more like what we would like to see, you know, the power threat meaning framework, more compassionate approaches, and so on. And I think that's why they can't do it, and why they did that preposterous response, right? Just preposterous. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. I think we all agree. Can I say one thing about TikTok and like, like what you were saying? So it's really interesting about you when you look at these kids that are, you know, what you really see is kids who have been, and I think this is why they're turning to these diagnostic stories. It's why they often turn to very ugly manifestations, far right wing misogynist sort of influences and so on. Um, you're looking at young people who've been really starved of stories, of connections. I mean, they have literally been shut away for two of the most formative years of their lives in their yeah. room, their phone. Uh, but even before that, by any historical standard, they were shut away 
compared to previous generations. And they, you know, um, so you're looking at these kids who are desperate for sources of meaning. And I don't blame them for latching on to, yeah. you've got all this pain that no one's ever given you any explanation for. And suddenly you've either got, you know, Jordan Peterson or Andrew Tate or or all the very simplistic diagnostic stories. I don't blame people for latching onto them. It's our job, which is exactly what you guys are doing, is to tell them better and more truthful stories about why they feel like that and actual ways forward that are not just kind of cul-de-sacs of hatred or or oversimplified and bizarre stories. You know, the but that hunger for explanations is something we should encourage, but just direct it towards actually meaningful, rich explanations that acknowledge complexity, admittedly hard to do in a 90 second video, but or actually 90 second would be like a thousand hours long for them. So a uh, you know, 10 second video. But I think that's that we, we've, we've got to tap into that and say to them, you're right to want these explanations and you're right to want stories. That story isn't gonna liberate you, but we can help you find stories that will. I am I'm one of the characters in my book, The Myth of Normal. He's actually a comedian, Daryl Hammond, who mm. about whose life there was a documentary um, called Cracked Up, I think, because he used to be addicted and so on. And um, he, he, he'd been through over 30 years, he's been to like 40 different psychiatrists, had multiple diagnoses. And he said, not until he come to the, came to terms with his story Mm. Did, he, did he actually begin healing and of course his story was that he was an abused child and he says that everybody else tells your story and the way they tell it you're totally powerless and and so that you regain your power by telling your actual story so narrative and story and listening to each other and uh, people actually saying the story of what happened to them this is where healing ha begins to happen I think that's so true, and I think the the the, the way I'm having a real epiphany about this when Lucy Johnson, our friend, um, the author, the brilliant co-author of the brilliant book, the the a straight talking guide to the power threat meaning framework, um, when she said to me years ago, she said, partly one of the reasons diagnosis is so harmful is it's the imposition of a story on a vulnerable individual, right? You're not constructing the story with them. You're not happy. You are telling, you're standing above them and telling them the story of what's wrong with them. As if they had, you know, look, if I break my knee now, I want to go to the doctor and I want them to stand over me and tell me the story. I'm not going to be in a position to figure out what's wrong with my knee, right? But it's as if we're treating human pain and distress as if it was an injured, you know, isolated part of the body and it's it's not that it's just not that, it, that that's not a productive way of talking or thinking about human pain um yeah so yeah i, I, I totally agree with that with, with um kind of the concept of hope and moving forward in mind i want you to talk a little bit about the end of um Stolen focus, Johan. You tell us about this guy in Russia. I think his name's James. Is it James Williams? James Williams, yeah. He talks about these four levels of attention spotlight, about focus on immediate tasks, starlight, focus on kind of longer term goals, and daylight, the one that makes it possible to um, reflect and make sense of ourselves. And he says that the attention crisis is depriving us all of all levels of attention spotlight starlight daylight we're losing our light that was really profound when i was reading that for the first time like we're left overwhelmed and depleted it's scary stuff mainly because it's so it rings true doesn't it it's, everyone can relate to that in this in this society in this culture but what was really encouraging was and really hopeful actually was when, when you mentioned the idea of this fourth level um you call it stadium light or stadium lights and it's that light that sees and hears hears us kind of as a collective hears and sees each other and thinks about what we can um do together for our collective goals and i just thought that was really hopeful can you just say a little bit more about that before we kind of come to a close today yeah, James Williams is an amazing person. So he worked at the heart of Google for years and years. And like a lot of people I got to know in Silicon Valley, he just became incredibly uncomfortable with what they were doing. And he had this real epiphany one day. He spoke at a tech conference where the audience are literally the people who design the stuff that your kids are using today, right? 
And he said to them, if there's anyone here who wants to live in the world that we're creating, please put up your hand. And nobody put up their hand, right? So not long afterwards, he quit and became, I would argue, the most important philosopher of attention in the world. He was living in Russia at the time because his wife worked for the World Health Organization. They're not there anymore for obvious reasons. Um, and and I'm, I'm never forgetting, he said to me, you know, we were talking about, so some of my books about why we're struggling to focus and pay attention. I go through these 12 factors, one of which is some aspects of how our current technology works. But he said to me, it's really helped me, he said, human beings had the ax for 1.2 million years before anyone said, guys, should we put a handle on this ax, right? The entire internet has existed for less than 10,000 days, right? The bits of it that don't work for us, we can fix them, right? It doesn't have to be that way. And for all of the 12 factors that are harming our attention that I write about in Style and Focus, most of them are pretty recent. We can remember the time before them, right? Um, so we can absolutely deal with these factors. To some degree, we can deal with them as individuals and to some degree, we have to deal with them as a society. But this is not some like just irrevocable part of the modern world. This is the result of very specific changes that benefit a tiny number of very rich people at the expense of everyone else. And we can put them right if we want to. Also, I go through the book a lot of the ways we can do that. But, but it requires a shift in consciousness, right? We need to stop blaming ourselves for our attention problems. I think there's something wrong with me, something wrong with you, something wrong with your child. And start seeing that this has been done to us, right? It's called stolen focus because your focus was stolen from you. And we need to realize we are not like medieval peasants begging at the court of King Musk and King Zuckerberg for like a few little crumbs of attention from their table. You know, we are the free citizens of democracies, hard won democracies, and we own our own minds. And together we can take them back from these forces that have stolen them. But the, the first step to doing that is to stop blaming ourselves and start blaming the fuckers who did it to us. Yeah, it's really powerful. It's like what your friend Ben Stewart was saying, who was very instrumental oh, in Greenpeace. Him. Like, you know, you, you've got to bring it to the attention of the public that it is a crisis. Has it been recognised or identified as such yet? And I think that's what we need exactly in this debate, you know, we need to kind of to bring that attention that we're, we're in a bit of a crisis in the way that we understand emotional distress, definitely in the way that we respond, but it's not yet seen as a crisis by the public out there. Um, so yeah, we need to kind of somehow make that happen. Now there's no doubt that you two are very, very well connected. Um, friends in high places and royal places, um, a massive, massive, massive public following. How can we, you know, how do you think that you can best use your connections to really inform change and to promote the, the messages and the ideas that you talk about in your books? Well, two things come to mind. One is, as I mentioned in our introduction before we came online, I think, I just came back from Greece. And uh, near Athens, there's a place called the Elysian Fields where the Athenians used to go in their thousands to take place in his mystical rituals. They walked, I think, 30 miles from London to Elysius, and uh, there's still a temple there and, 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 and a museum, and they would dance and chant, and the priest would invoke, and there'd be group activities, and they would drink this brew that may or may not have had psychedelic quality to it. There's a debate about that. But the point is that healing and connection with something greater than an individual was a social and group activity. Whereas our society has isolated us so much. We do it all on our own. We're diagnosed on our own. Our, our organs are separated from the body and organs get diagnosed <clears throat> rather than human beings and rather than human beings in context. So I think part of what we're talking about is the creating of new context, which goes against the individualizing and isolating ethic of globalized capitalism. In terms of how to make our voices more effective, truly, I don't know what, how to say that, how to answer that question, because uh, Johan and I both speak to multiple thousands of people around the world every year, um, including our home countries, but abroad as well. Um, we write books that are read in hundreds of thousands or millions by people. That's not available to everybody. 
that kind of platform. We have been fortunate enough to be able to develop that platform, but for most people, I would say, whatever platform you have and whatever venue you have, speak out, tell your truth and tell your story and join with others that on whatever level. That's what I got to say. Yeah, I, th I think I think I always think about this. I always think about change through the prism of being gay, right? And you know, um, I'm 44 years old, and I don't think I heard the concept of gay marriage. I don't think I've ever heard that phrase, gay marriage, until I was 21. The idea had never occurred to me. I went through my entire childhood and adolescence, and the, the idea that gay people could ever get married had literally never even crossed my mind, right? It, um, and the transformation has happened unbelievably quickly, right? I think about, um, you know, Joe's met one of my nephews, and I remember I once showed him things that were the front page of the best-selling newspaper in Britain, The Sun, when I was the age he was then, um, that were just staggeringly homophobic. Right? I think when Elton John got engaged, uh, no, he wasn't engaged, we started going out with David Furnish. The headline was, we're right behind you, Elton, brackets, but not too close. Um, and my nephew, Ben, said, did people call the police? Like, it was just like, completely taken aback by this, right? It was, it was unthinkable. I mean, like the idea now, it would be unthinkable that any newspaper would say anything like that, right? I mean, they have plenty of hatred towards plenty of people, but they wouldn't say that about gay people now. Um, and how did that change happen? It happened because huge, particularly in the generation before me, huge numbers of gay men and women just bravely came out in their workplaces, in their families, in their neighborhoods, at, which was hard. It wasn't hard for me. It was hard for them, right? It was really hard for the generation before them. Uh, but they did it. And they did it in a spirit of love and compassion. And they appealed to other people in a spirit of love and compassion. And I think most cultural change very little cultural change happens in a top down, you know, you have these people at the top who, that's not how cultural change happens. Cultural change happens in a bottom up way, right? Um, and, and that requires, so I think on the question of diagnosis, it requires the conversation, like, how well has this worked for us, right? We've been, we talk more and more in these diagnostic terms with every year that passes. We don't deal with the underlying social and psychological causes. And every year we're more fucking miserable than we were the year before. So I don't think there's many people who would disagree with those premises, right? Um, so once you do that, you can begin to have a more open conversation. I think the key is it's difficult to not enter this conversation in a state of anger because people are being misled and they're being um, exploited. But I think entering it in a spirit of anger doesn't help us. It doesn't help us to do the key job we need to do, which is to persuade people. I'm not saying there's no place for anger, there's some. But I think with the more we can infuse the way we talk and think in a spirit of love and compassion, um, the more effective we'll be. And I, and I really I absolutely believe this is right for a transition. And it's, it's beginning, right? It's beginning. The, the debate is different now. I think I've, Joe and I first met six years ago. And already the debate is unrecognizable from when we first met, right? But lot, partly thanks to the incredible work of Disorder for Everyone has done. So these debates are moving fast. And I think they will continue to move fast if we do, if we communicate. And I think everyone in the audience is as powerful as everyone else, right? Because it is a bottom-up change and it is a it is a, a change that 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 only happens through if if huge numbers of people do it in a spirit of love and compassion. Yeah. And I do have to say that um, um, amongst younger doctors, there's much more conversation about these things. So even, even, even although I'm rather, uh, I'm rather hesitant to be too enthusiastic about the medical mainstream's capacity to change, amongst younger physicians, I'm seeing so much more interest and in new conversations and real dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with the old paradigm. So even within the within the precincts and fortresses of the mainstream medical um, world, I see uh, interest and change and, and um, a dissatisfaction with the old paradigm. I'm really loving the optimism of both of you and I think it's a great 
It's a great note to finish on. Okay, um, speaking of optimism, can I just recommend it to one sentence? The um, people who want to read a book about optimism, a fantastic book, a, amazing book, in fact, is a book called Hope in the Dark by Rebecca Solnit. It's S O L N I T. Um, an incredible book about how do you maintain hopeful in, in really distressing situations. Have you got it there, Gabor? I'm going to hold it up for the camera. Camera. Uh, it's a, a really wonderful. Um, I always think about a line she says in it. Um, I might misquote it slightly, but she said, "Hope is not a lottery ticket that you sit <laughs> on the sofa clutching, hoping your number comes up. Hope is an axe you use to break down the door in an emergency." Right? Such a well, great. There we go. There's the book. It's, do, do you love that book, Gabor? It's great, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I caught it in the middle of normal actually. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna. I, I thought about buying that, but now I'm definitely oh, gonna correct. buy that. So thank you for that share. Uh, um, it's brilliant. But you know, it, we all need a bit of optimism, don't we? Sometimes it's really difficult. You know, it's it's sometimes really difficult. So optimism is good, and hope is good, and these conversations are good. So thanking you you know, massively for your time today. We, we all really appreciate it. Um, and thanks for being such good friends and allies of AD4E and, and for all that you do to challenge the crap. So keep on troublemaking. Um, I oh, mean, you're, you're a very easy person to be an ally of, Joe, because you do such amazing work. You do it so oh, totally and so brilliantly. And thank you, Gabor, for slamming it with us commoners. for, for yeah. <laughs> well, <hey. laughs> Bye, both. Catch you soon. <laughs> Okay. Hooray. One.